Okay. Hello, everyone. This might be our last podcast that is about training you into doing things. So um, I probably will be pinching myself for that for those words and probably produce another one, maybe a collaborate session. Please remember, we have collaborate sessions every Thursday at 5 p.m. We will still have them until the end of this month. So um, I hope some of you who have questions might actually appear there. If you don't, then we'll see, we will see each other on the discussion board. OK, so. We had a few already. Uh, we already had a few comments on the discussion board relating to assignment two, so that's really good. The only thing that is worrying me at this very moment relates to the questions that I have here on the screen. So what worries me is that um, we are all focusing on lesson design, and I kind of understand it because for 200 years teachers have been focusing on on lesson design which i suspect makes it legitimate since we've been doing this for 200 years why not now so that's the first thing you can hear a little bit of uh, irony here there's a reason for it and i will explain it um because what would happen if you had a bad lesson design but if you had other things in place Ever thought about it? I mean, if there is a bad lesson design, what else can be there in place that actually can save the day only, or even make it a winner? So that's something that I put into you because you're, uh, you, you know, because I can. <laughs> all right. So, uh, so that. So all of you are focusing on how to design the lessons. I am not interested in the lesson design. I certainly will spend some time on this. Uh, but I don't want to overestimate it simply because in the past I was trying to combine with my ELA 200 students both a, a design and um, a reading support. And I think that a, a number of students couldn't, couldn't really balance the two. So even though I will teach you how to design from my perspective, what I will do, I will underplay it and I will give you a good a good framework, a good robust framework, but not necessarily something that you should actually lose your sleep over. What I want you to lose your sleep over is actually reading support. I would like you to read in the module four, the lengthy text that I produced as an introduction. This text, every semester I change, every semester I change because I get different assignment. Well, I teach differently every semester, but also I actually adjust to, to students uh, as, um, to the feedback that I gave to students. And basically, what has become apparent to me that most of the time, that the students who didn't do very well, so we had like you know, 50% of the class did very very well, but the other 50% of the class didn't do fantastically. And you know, you should all do. You should all get get. High, high, anything between high distinction and distinction. Credit is all right, but you should do actually very well. You should aim for that. And if the whole class does very well, I am absolutely not hesitating to give everyone high distinctions. So here we go. There, in the volume, in, in, pardon me, in module four, I explain what reading support is. And this is totally misunderstood. People do not study what I give you, which means they actually are not reading learning support. So that's OK. We will try to sort of deal with it now. And that's what I wanted to say. I will be assessing the way you help students to learn to read. I will not be caring that much about reading support. I will ask about two things that would be present in your design. Two things, probably. The rest I'm least interested because you're going to have, look, I'm fighting a, a never ending battle between every unit that is teaching you a different lesson design. I'm happy to lose the battle, but I'm not happy to lose the battle of teaching you how to actually support students reading. So let me say it because there is a culture in education and I'm increasingly exposed to it. There's a culture in education where reading support is understood as giving students tasks. That's just not the way to go, OK? Uh, and I'll go on with that. I'll explain it later. So telling students 
what they must do create a story answer these questions read this text this is not reading support this is requesting things from people right so if i gave you now a text in polish and in or in other language and i would say to you read it that's how a student feels when they are given a task from a t by a teacher from a teacher and then left alone and then sometimes worse happens or, or not worse what very often happens is the teacher thinks that they gave a support to the student because the teacher thinks well that you should get it what i'm saying but the teacher is not in the student's head so now the student is not gonna get it just like you imagine students in your classroom are exactly what you are here with me doesn't matter how explicitly I produce the resources. You know, you can't blame me or fault me on the module four. It has five billion of letters. There are lots of resources. It's divided between different problems and it's divided between different levels of schooling. And yet, had it not been for my warm heart reaching out to you and understanding that you cannot see it from my perspective, whatever I have put there, I could actually be quite severe, saying, well, it is all there, it's explicit, it's with PowerPoint, everything is there, right? I mean, pictures you have, you have all kinds of video, you know, you know all the resources, and you still can't get it. And that's the kind of situation which you have in schools, that you produce a lot of help, or maybe not, but whatever you do and what makes sense to you, remember that the other person is not in your shoes. The other person is in a different world, and he is the problem of, of learning, very, right? It's very often a, a form of communication where teacher is, is um, made feel secure by whoever outside, um, policymakers, by experience, by other people telling you you teach well. People look for uh, confidence from all kinds of sources, but no matter how much how confident we might be and how much we could justify ourselves, we continuously have to re-examine what, what we can do in order to allow students to look at the task of reading from their perspective not from our perspective right and that's feedback feedback is not what you think you gave to the student is what the student got out of it it's what fed back to the kid not what you have provided for the student that's a very important difference okay so um I've got these few questions here, so I just want to tackle them quickly. So what is reading? What is literacy and reading? Are you teaching literacy or are you teaching reading? Right. So we spoke for eight weeks about literacy and you were quite in pain to identify the things that you, I mean, the, the, the resources and experiences you draw on in order to do anything in the world. Right, you can't just write an email to anyone, and I'm very grateful. Most of you don't write to me. I'm very grateful. That's that's a skill. That's a skill to know that you're not gonna write three thousand emails to the lecture because that those emails are gonna disappear among other emails, right? So that's a skill. Not writing or not knowing when not to say something, knowing when not to write something, it's a skill. So many of you have it and that's fantastic, but where did you learn it? Right, I remember when the email happened, I'm sure that we used to write any nonsense to everybody all the time until we actually learned in time that the people at the other at the receiving end is not the that we are not the only person that are writing to this person. So we learned through pain and God knows what else the experience that, you know, it, it, the inbox fills very quickly, fills up very quickly. So, so okay, so are you to teach reading? Why am I raising this? Because for eight weeks we were learning what literacy is, and literacy is what? It's, it's, it's a social skill, you say, you write, right? You'll be writing this even probably in assignment two, and then you will reduce, not you will reduce, but a lot of students, like 50% of students from the last semester reduce re literacy to and reading as a result to let's decipher the text. 
but we were learning first that literacy is well, you can decipher the text, so, so there's no one way to interpret it. But basically what I'm saying is we're not teaching reading as an isolated skill. We're teaching reading as a skill that depends on experiences and other texts that you bring into the context of skill of, of reading. And also that depends also on the purpose. Nobody just reads. Only in schools you read for reading's sake. And it's not for reading's sake. It is for... Um, very often when the teacher pops in into the classroom with a book and says today we're going to read this big book and you know you'll be exposed to it in schools and you probably will be requested to do it yourselves and you may even like doing this. The point is why are the students doing the reading of the book you chose? And th that's the question we that we will raise today. And that's the question I would like you to think for yourself because if literacy is a social experience and that means that we didn't invent literacy to talk about it, we invented literacy to make our lives faster, better and more convenient, then what form of convenience is facilitated by you choosing a big book and read, or even students choosing a big book and reading one book in class? Maybe there's a reading for pleasure, you can say. Fantastic. What other forms of purposes we could have for reading? And it seems to me that we've, we've very quickly run out of purposes, right? So that's the first problem I wanted to raise. So we should not teach reading for reading's sake in order to satisfy teachers need to fill the time, to fill the hour, but we always should see the, the activity of reading as a literacy experience and therefore a purposeful activity it has to serve something remember any act, any tool that we use like say a birthday card is something that we chose because society invented it to make you know certain things easier or nicer but we're not creating a birthday card we're creating a birthday card in order to make to put a smile on someone's face well how do you do it and most of all how do you know how to do it Right? That, that's, that's the lesson of assignment one. Took us eight weeks to get there. Right. And this is your algorithm. So I want you to copy and paste this algorithm exactly how you, as you would paste one plus one equals two. So when you repeat the sentence after me, I use particular tool because this is tool commonly used by people. And I will use it in order to effect a specific, uh, to generate a specific effect. That's a structure that needs to be continuously remembered because that reminds you that nobody just reads, we read for purpose and it's the purpose that will now inform what kind of things we bring into the classroom in order for this purpose to be fulfilled. Because you, when you write the birthday card for your friend, you know exactly, you know every comedy on the planet, you know all the symbols and, ref and frames of reference, especially if you're writing in English and you've been in English for a while, so you've seen all those movies and so on. It gets harder when you're from East Timor and you're doing this in English because it's really hard to relate to um, faulty towers or something when you've never seen them. So you see a birthday card makes the reference to faulty towers. You have no idea what it is. You still might think it's funny, but the meaning that you want to actually um, communicate through this through that selection of this particular birthday card might be still about laughing, but actually it will draw on different frames of reference. So to reiterate, reading for literacy, if we're reading for literacy as opposed to, to just do a few exercises in the classroom uh, and um, write and not actually being explicit about the link of that to literacy as a means of critical participation in the society, yeah? literacy is a means of critical participation. So if we're actually reading for literacy, we need to think of it in relation to the following questions I would suggest. So the first one is what are we doing this for, right? And some of you might have already gotten some responses from me on the discussion board and every time I see your task, we'll be reading this, we'll be discussing this, we'll be even brainstorming things. I'm not sure that brainstorming is such a good activity, but anyway, everybody is into it, so <clears throat> there. Um, because everybody wants to brainstorm, but 
children don't have anything in their brains why, why don't we just storm the resources right so 21st century is a century of resource-based learning nobody talks about resources and developing resources everybody talks about brainstorming well at nine o'clock in the morning when i talk to my university students they have no brain trying to storm them every time i come closer to them and i open my mouth to ask a question they hide under the tables right so and they're 30 so you can imagine how the little child feels when you ask them to storm something that they didn't even have a coffee to actually get going because they're too young to drink coffee. So there you go. I mean, I, I, I think there's place for everything, but I think that we have overused particular um, uh, phrases and therefore particular practices in school. So anyway, let me stay on the topic. So what are we doing this for? So why are we doing this particular reading? Why are we doing this particular activities? Why are we doing this? In what way is this actually teaching children to um, to read for crit critical participation? I mean, you might say, oh yeah, I'm, I taught them this and I taught them that. It's not the point. The point is, what did they get out of it? And how did you assure that they did? So what are we doing this for is the first question. And the second question is, what do the students need to know to do it well. So what is it that they actually are doing? And what is it that they need to know to do it well? Right? And that was a big, of, a big headache for assignment one, because what are we doing this for? That was really hard to think that we're not just actually buying birthday cards, we're buying them for a particular purpose. Now we had to actually identify how the heck do we know that this particular thing is gonna make them laugh right so how do you, where did you know the meaning of those symbols what what did you read what did you watch what kind of experiences did you draw on in order to know that's funny that's funny but the kid doesn't know so you in order for the child to read anything meaningfully or to read forget about meaningfully i don't like that word because everybody overuses it in order for the child to know or better to evaluate their own um, effectiveness, right? To evaluate their own effectiveness. What can they do it in relation to? Well, they have to have a look where, where, where else have they seen that? How else it was done? And somewhere else was it done the same way? Are there any similarities, right? Everything we did, we've done in assignment one, is exactly what we need to bring into the classroom. We need to now bring a pile of resources into the classroom so that when the student is actually reading and evaluating the power of their reading, their own effectiveness, they can't evaluate. Traditionally, and in 99% of schools, the evaluator is the teacher, sometimes the peers. But peers don't know everything, and the teacher cannot explain everything. We need to personalize it, which means we need to bring resources. So that in, there are, so when, we, when it comes to what you might call lesson design, and I would call inquiry design, inquiry design, Every inquiry needs to have resources. Why are you? We all. Why are we all sitting on the computer? Be it Facebook, be it anything, because it's a pile of resources there, right? And yet, when a child, when children are five, six, seven, especially when they're young, and even when they're older, we forget that that's why they love computers, because there are resources out there, and we, and we reduce those resources. And not only that we don't, we reduce resources, we also do not learn how to organize them for meaningfulness or for usefulness. Again, I should not be using the word meaning. Overdone, overused. All right, so what are we doing this for? And what do the, student need to, what do the students need to know to do it well? Okay, so that's these two questions. But the one that is overriding all of this is, what is it that we are doing? Right? What is it that we are doing? Well, it didn't have to be all um, selected. What is it that we're doing? Yeah, what is it that you're doing? And what are you doing this for? What is it that you're doing? Uh, we're reading a book. Well, we just said in our assignment too that nobody reads a book. Someone reads a book for particular, to generate particular effect in themselves, 
right? So whether it's a pleasure of reading or maybe they read a book in order to get some quotations from it for their assignment or they read the book in order to find, um, I don't know, some, you know, people read books for all kinds of reasons. Um, you know, not, not ev every time you read a book, you might be reading it for a different reason. You might be reading it to actually remind yourself something, remind yourself an experience, or maybe to have a look how the author wrote it so you could actually um, analyze his structures or her structures and actually maybe repurpose it a little bit so you can see it. So what is it very, what, that we are doing has to be connected with what are we doing this for. And that element four, that four element, has to come from the community. And I'm happy if someone has another view. The point is literacy comes from community, from the community. So you cannot have a purpose of reading that is actually not satisfying or is not oriented towards actually performing something that draws its relevance from the com community and will impact on the community. Even if the community is one person, there is no one, no, no one person is not a community because if you want to make, if you want to send me a birthday card and you say, well, it's only the school, say I'm a school principal, the whole activity of sending someone a birthday card draws on the community's experience and knowledge and it will be done within the rules and rituals that are actually established by the community right so even doing something for one person it is a social practice so what is it that we are doing it cannot be just reading a book it can be a reading a book as a thing that people do for a particular reason and we're doing this in order to do something specific right so that structure we have to hang, hang on to so to summarize what is it that we are doing we are reading a book as a source of examples for example right uh, as a source of examples about how people lived 300 years ago so books sometimes are about pleasure sometimes they are sources of factual information right so I, so that's what I'm just uh, still playing with you a little bit but basically so what what is it that we're reading we're reading a book as a source right because this is a tool that people use in order to communicate factual information right so the book is a, as a source or as a tool to communicate factual information so here it is a book as a source of examples of how people lived 300 years ago and what are we reading this for so I might be reading this in order to, to learn the genre of factual uh, presentation, uh, of uh, to learn about the genre of factual, how to present factual information. And here, what is it that I wrote? Uh, what are we doing this for? We are reading this in order to examine the concept of social and technological progress, you know, or the concept of concepts of social and technological progress and then what students need to know to do it well they need to know they need to learn a number of things for example compare the genre of the text right so you know that not every factual text the way it reads it actually i mean some genres actually the way they the way they communicate facts you can actually have enough of experience to know that they actually are a bit on a shonky side so you, you you need to actually uh sensitize students that not every so you, and through compare and contrast by showing examples not every text that actually looks like a factual text is a factual text the, the different structures they use different emotions they actually communicate right you you know for yourselves that the more powerful and the more emotionally uh, charge a specific factual text is it is less likely but not always but less likely to be actually uh, factual but then you need to also provide resources so here are examples that confirm what I just said and negate so for example when you have um, um, a, a strong perspective say from a particular ideology 
right that's what ideology is it actually is it, it's it is a perspective that is sh that shuts itself uh, down from any communication with any other perspective so that's why we call it ideology it's not an idea it's a locked up caged view that is not um, amicable to any other dialogue right so we can have so we know that texts of this kind have a very powerful emotions have a very powerful language charged with emotions and it's that's where uh, I mean not only but that's where you can actually use my uh, analysis uh, of text through emotions it's it's, re it's really gonna come through but you also can have other texts which are very much factual but also charged emotionally, right? So when people went through horrific experiences of genocide or something, they're not going to say that in Cambodia in 1975, three million people were killed. And I, I mean, some texts like Encyclopedia might talk this way, but uh, eyewitness texts will not talk, uh, are not likely to speak in a, to, to, to communicate facts in a factual way, right? They, w they are quite likely to be emotional, right so even though they don't lie so you you will have to analyze that so you can imagine even if you were reading a book as a source of examples about what was happening 300 years ago or 20 years ago or whatever as a source of information primary source or maybe secondary source like so primary sources like a witness report and secondary resource uh, sources like uh, encyclopedia or a history book so if you read a book as a source of examples about something that has happened uh, so you read it with what purpose well i'm reading this in order to examine particular concepts of progress and technology and you know social progress and te uh, technological progress do they go together and where how do they help each other where there is a disjunction and so on but in order to actually make those conclusions without being uh, taken by the book and i'm a greatest example I'm the least critical I teach critical thinking all the time you know I, I guess that's what happens when you have least of it you actually teach it right because um, or when you are least skilled in something because I actually developed that muscle because I never had it I was I, I was very easily taken uh, swept away by people's arguments so uh, not necessarily obvious ones but you know like when I read a text or something I really f I'm so easy to it's so easy for me to flow with a text and basically believe in everything I read. So I developed that. So uh, so for your students, in order to actually examine those concepts, you need to give them tools to actually examine, as opposed to swallow the book and rep reproduce it and repeat it. Before I move a little bit to early childhood to give example of this kind, but in relation to early childhood, I wanted to say the following. Um, why would you want, because I'm trying to actually get to, to, to the three or four points of structuring, uh, um, a, a structuring an inquiry, how to help students to structure an inquiry. And I just want to make it really simple for you. So that's why it's taking a bit of uh, thinking. But why would you want students to read a book at all, at all, of any kind? I mean, I know you have a curriculum, but we should have other reasons, right? Than just say, oh, because it's written in here, in, you know, year seven or year six, it says we, you have to read a book or two. So what I wrote here for you is as follows. You want your students to read because reading is part of the process of our cultural learning and cultural transformation. Now, you, everybody understands cultural learning. Not everybody understands cultural transformation. As you learn, you change. You undergo transformation, right? And it's important to expose yourself or be exposed to a number of experiences of, div of different sources with different people so that you actually acquire um, a, a range of cultural learning and therefore your cultural transformation is rich as opposed to being stuck you know in a very narrow space with two books and that's it 
Okay, so you want your students to read because reading is part of the process of cultural learning and cultural transformation. Reading for literacy is all about community, therefore, right? So we don't read in order to one day become a, co a part of the community. We're reading because we're reading for literacy, not for the sake of reading. And we're reading for and reading for literacy means it is all about community. So now I'm going to tell you two things that might look to you a little bit new, or one thing I don't know. It's one sentence I think, uh, but it is simple. It is simple if you take it, fre you know, with your fresh eyes. Your teaching objectives do not derive from the Akara, but from the community. Well, where do you think the people who created Akara got them from? Right? Funny, isn't it? Funny is to think about it. So your teaching objectives do not derive from, Ak from the Akara, but from the community. Akara helps you, the Australian curriculum helps you better understand what the community told you that matters. And I want you to, a little, to think a little bit about it. So what does it mean that your teaching objectives do not derive from Akara, but from the community? Um, it is quite normal at schools, and I have seen it, to take things literally. To take things literally, but we shouldn't be taking things literally because l such a thing doesn't actually exist. Literal means narrow band of frames of reference in relation to which something is understood. It is not understood critically, it is understood in a limited way. So that's what literal means. And literal means, well, I've got to teach them words because it says we need to teach them vocabulary. No, you don't have to teach them vocabulary. What you need to ensure is that they know words. But what you, but, but how you will go about making sure that they actually can read words and understand words, that's your story. That's called pedagogy, right? Pedagogy is the process through which that you invent, that you create, and I'm teaching it to you. It's a process that you create in order to turn a dead curriculum, dead words on the two-dimensional piece of paper and make li bring li breathe life into them, right? Akara is just a dead two-dimensional document. You now need someone who is smart, who will actually, on the basis of readings, experience, and different um, things they are able to actually integrate together, they're going to turn it into a process to turn this two-dimensional thing into into a four-dimensional process. Four-dimensional because time matters. So into, into a four-dimensional process so that um, your, stu your, your curriculum then becomes alive. So we don't, we don't teach to Akara, we use Akara to better understand what the community told us that matters. And this is what you did in assignment two. We didn't actually evaluate reading, your reading experiences or your reading knowledge or your uh, literacy knowledge against Akara. We used Akara to better understand what you actually know, right? So we were unpacking things. Oh my goodness, what does interaction and evaluation mean? It means understanding uh, evaluation is and comprehension is not how I read the text, but understanding what I'm bringing to the text, right? Because what I'm bringing into the text is going to actually impact on how I actually comprehend it. So what the heck do I bring into the text? And there it was. Oh my God, all these experiences, all these books that I read on this topic, all these things that I read on other topics that helped me, that helped me understand that this is not about that, right? So what we did, we used Akara to actually unpack how much we know about the world and how much we bring into the literacy experience. And here it's the same thing. We're not teaching Akara, we're using Akara to actually help us, or the curriculum, to better understand what the community tells us, that tells us that matters. And now um, I will leave it here because there in, in my, in the, in one or two slides from now, I will turn it into a principle of design. 
it's in your module four but all this discussion helps you to actually understand it better so in the concept in, in the pardon me in the context of um, early years learning framework or an early primary teaching the situation is exactly the same so again you read them be, you, you want students to read because reading is part of the western in, in the western world part of the cultural learning and cultural transformation reading is about community and again here would be if ACARA or earliest learning framework depends depending on the age in early years learning framework depending on the age of the students right you will use either this or the other curriculum so the curriculum helps you to better understand what the community told you that matters now I, I, obviously I will explain this so as we were talking about this kind of these kind of examples about reading in here so in terms of early years learning framework and the primary curriculum so you're not just reading a book but for example you are reading the book as a source of imaginary worlds and positive role models right that's what books are, um, can be used for and that's how books are written right as a source for children of imaginary worlds to, to engage their creativity and also to communicate positive role models so that's the reading as a tool for communicating these things and you might be using it uh, specifically to examine for, ch for with, with children to examine these concepts in relation to their own experiences and what is it that the students need to know to do it well to do this examination well students need to compare the genres of the text um, the structures and, and so on pardon me um, so again I will make the point that in order for children just like in the uh, when you work and support reading of older children with young children also children cannot extract the meaning from words or from the pictures which is very often uh, suggested pictures are great but um, what what is necessary is that students also in early years are presented with the process of reading as a as a resource based process which means that when they want to uh, when, when we actually develop concepts that emerge and that we're examining in a specific text we need to actually have access to resources to verify um, or to evaluate the relevance of our uh, beliefs right so that we are not stuck with one text and therefore we produce limited associations uh, it is absolutely a no-no to do that children have billions upon billions of cells neur uh, um, neurons that are developing and they ha th that's the time when they actually can do just about anything as you know so uh, the idea that we're loading them with information because we're, uh, we're exposing them to resources and to um, opportunities to check information across different texts is gonna overload them it is actually wrong what overloads children is lack of information they get confused uh, if we do not understand something we'll go to this website to this website we'll check it here and there right because meaning is associations meaning is not one-to-one -one representation it's associations so we need to actually enable children um, in the process of their reading to be given access to resources that allow them to create rich associations so this resource-based um, reading uh, is critical I've spoken about it in my previous lecture where I was actually talking about the kinds of um, support systems that you should be thinking of developing to support students reading so 
uh, one of the things that I always talk about that teachers should actually create resources and organize them smartly. So to have databases, to organize them in databases, either in folders, organize them online in databases, either way. So that I also have libraries, obviously, and know what is where. And I will talk about it um, later. And also into the classroom, pre uh, predict what kinds of resources would be useful and actually have them handy. Do not be stuck with one book. It is tiring to continuously for the whole class to look at one picture for two hours because usually those lessons take two hours. It's tiring and you can't extract much out of one picture or one word. Compare contrast. But anyway, just to summarize here, what is it that I've written here for you? So reading for literacy. That means use literacy as a tool of cultural learning and cultural transformation, not just reading. If you reduce reading to reading, you're not actually reading. That's the problem because students don't have opportunity to connect the activity into their own lives and, and their own lives in the community. So reading needs to be embedded in the community so that children can actually draw on their experiences in the community to do some things with this reading. Like, for example, evaluate the understandings they bring into the reading and evaluate not against yes and no of a teacher, but also evaluate against other resources. So there, I'm saying the same thing over and over again, but that's okay. So here I've written four points. The, so these four points, what are they? I'm just thinking of the simplest way in which I can actually transform, uh, communicate to you how to actually go about developing your um, plans for teaching reading or for assisting in literacy development. So, um, so let's let us go through this slide and the next slide quickly and see what it means. So develop your classroom curriculum from the interactions with the community. Now that's probably new. I think that a lot of people don't stress it. And I can see it in your lesson develop uh, lesson plans or lesson ideas uh, on the discussion board. You already know what you will be doing. I'll make them tell a story. I'll, I'll, I'll invite an Aboriginal person and they will talk about the museum or something or now I'll invite something. So these are good ideas, but, but where did you get them from? So they are good ideas, but they are but they are actually that not necessarily in the right um, order. So develop your classroom uh, curriculum from the interactions with the community. I just read it out and I will trans, uh, translate it later. What I mean by that: derive your teaching objectives from the community, right? Because that's where literacy lives. It actually was created by the community for the community. So derive your teaching objectives from the community. So connect with the community, derive your objectives from the community, compare these objectives against ACARA or earliest learning framework, and then prepare resources to help students do whatever I write there. We explain it later on. So prepare resources to help your students identify the goals that they want to pursue. Whatever that means, it means just prepare resources to enable students to achieve those objectives, right? So that's what it means. Um, there will obviously be an overlap between what they want to pursue and what you prepare here. There will be some form of overlap, otherwise the, otherwise the, um, the, pro, the, 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 the design will, would not work. So what, it, what does it mean? Sorry, wrong slide. <laughs> now, you will, when you go to schools and when you have particular meetings here and there and especially conferences or pro professional development, everybody will talk to you about community engagement. And then typically people actually don't know what community engagement means and they translate it into parent engagement. But if I could point it out to you, but parent engagement is not community engagement, it's parent en engagement. And very often you will not get parents on your side, not because they are not educated, as sometimes I read, or because it's a low socioeconomic background, as I keep reading, it is not always that. I have, I have friends who are extremely educated. They both are artists. And they're both professionals, they're both business, they run businesses in Sydney, and they never, I mean, they, they get engaged 
nowadays a little bit better when their business has settled down and they can actually afford more time but when the child was in her early because i know because i'm the godmother of the child right so uh when the child was in her early years there was there would have never been the situation where the father or the mother would have been in school helping you with this or that they were just hoping that you will do your job and they can do their job so your job is to teach them and their job was to make sure that that girl can actually survive from day to day right they were migrant family from romania there was no way on the planet that they would have had enough time to actually spread themselves around they had no grandparents here or, or anything so complaining about parents in, inability to actually take part in schools i think that you know i cannot take it away from the school if they complain about it and they think it is illegitimate but i mean it is that it is a legitimate claim and all of that i can't i don't want to take part in that debate but what i'm saying to you is i want you to actually focus a little bit also on broadening the concepts and actually thinking also about community engagement and i know that in schools, every school in Darwin at least or has an indigenous officer or cultural officer. I also know that principals are pretty well connected to the community. And I also know that not just principals, our schools are pretty well connected to the community. So we have a number of things in the community. We have, what do we have? We have hospitals. And you'd think, well, so, well, we have, you know, sick children in the hospital. Some of those children are actually children of our community. And they then were here. They're not participating in classes. Well, wouldn't it be nice to do something nice uh, for them, right? Wouldn't it be nice to do something nice for those children, even if they are there for four days. As a, Some of them are for longer time, some of them for shorter time. But wouldn't it be nice to stay in touch? So anyway, so there are hospitals, there are HK centers, well, there's, uh, there, there are sports clubs with which you can in, engage to do things with and for. I don't know, there are multicultural for, uh, forums or fora, actually. It's, in English, people say forums, but it should be fora, actually. So there are in, in, intercultural spaces created by... Um, I actually don't know who creates those I part the, or NGOs maybe of sorts, but there are also NGOs out there. So there are community groups and the community groups are created. There are pigeon clubs and chicken clubs. I know that because I participated in, in duck clubs and pigeon clubs. There's everything club out there. People gather together in order to find like-minded people to do uh, interesting things, the things that interest them. And exposing children to this uh, association, to these communities, to this life, so that they can actually participate and do things with them and for them would be good. I mean, children participate in any event. You know, there's, there's, when we have a Brisbane Exhibition Day or Sydney Exhibition Day, there's five billion of children there, right? And they look at chickens and eggs and sheep, right? But this big uh, single show has little local shows all throughout Australia. So there is plenty of little regional duck clubs, pigeon clubs and all of that. And they rely on what? On prizes. They need prizes desperately. And they're not going to give for the best chicken $300, although sometimes they do. But they need things like colored plates. They need things like nice calendars. They need something produced by children, right? Wow, fantastic place to actually engage uh, with. What else? There's cricket clubs everywhere, sports clubs everywhere. They need to send out flyers. They need to communicate information. They, they might actually want to actually interest other children in their activity. Um, so there's plenty of things that you can actually can meet up with those people. You can devise projects and it's exciting because all of a sudden you're not just a school teacher. You are now a community worker. You are working with people of different kinds. So when you go to the hospital, you meet nurses, you meet doctors, you, you learn from them about the environment of a hospital and how nice it would be to create something. What is possible to create for children and what is not possible, right? what kind of needs the, the sports club have what kinds of needs um hk centers have what kind of population they have wouldn't it be nice to create a book uh, in english and then run it through google translate and um do it in chinese vietnamese in every other possible language so all of that so what i'm saying there is life out there and you are not a school teacher you are a person that is the link between the life out there and the little 
uh, and bigger students that you have. So by you engaging with those communities, your life becomes more interesting, but also the life of your students becomes interesting. So develop your classroom curriculum from your interactions with the community. What is out there? What is it that they need? So the second point is derive your teaching objectives from the community. And now I translate this into um, into second point on the right. Identify. So this is the principle and this is the translation into practice. So now is derive your teaching objectives from the community. So I said identify with the community what would be of value to the community for the students to do. Right sit down chat people love that people love being relevant all these um, presidents of a local cricket club and all of that I mean I know that this exists because I actually was part of that I was actually um, one of one of the by accident actually I got involved in so many activities at the local and federal also level of, of Australia uh, Australian communities but I have uh, actually my life became 3,000 times bigger and better as a result and expanded so that's what I'm suggesting to you go out meet up people have a coffee with them have a great time bring them to school and, and or if you can bring all the people to the school bring the needs of them to the school and uh, engage your students in that Compare these objectives, right? So you identify the objectives. What is what is actually? So you have to derive your objectives from the community. So you went out, you identified what they need. Say, for example, this is for older children. For for younger children, they can do the same, right? So how can we actually um, advertise among students? that you know cricket is great for you or something. You know cricket is great for you. How can we how can we spread this message around the school? So compare this objective against ACARA. So this is what the club wants. The club wants to actually popularize cricket among children because you know it's always there's never enough children participating in in, a, in cricket or some other game, right? So heck, so compare these objectives now. This objective about popularizing cricket among uh, school children. Compare this obje uh, these objectives, whatever that, that whatever they want against whatever ACARA says now or early years framework oh my goodness this is gonna be a job it will be no different than what you did in assignment one so have a look what is involved have a look how you can actually connect capabilities and outcomes together and see what's involved in order to do the specific thing that the your connections with uh, the community actually revealed and now I might actually word it differently, okay? So you'll forgive me to communicate these goals to the students, okay? Prepare resources to communicate to communicate these goals, these or these objectives here to the students, and that translates into identify activities that would engage students. Sorry for those. Identify activities that would engage students in the use of those resources to pursue their goals. Or maybe better, identify activities that would engage students in the use of those resources to pursue these goals. How about that for a moment? Right, because you actually have particular goals with which you actually that that, that you created as a result of your interactions with the community. You have actually explored how these goals now could actually relate uh, to the um, Australian curriculum or early years learning framework. Now, what you, what I'm asking you is to think of resources that you could use, and I know, I'll tell you soon what it means. Create resources through with which you could actually communicate these goals to the students, because what I'm saying is, it, it, it actually it's not a nice way to stand up in front of a student as you walk in and say, well, today we're gonna do some flyers for cricket club. I mean, the people go going, oh yeah, we are. Oh, 
so you identify so you prepare resources to communicate these goals and then you identify so to do that and and then you and that translates into also uh, identifying activities that would engage students in the use of those resources right so so that they can actually learn by themselves about the community needs and sometimes the process of learning about the community needs may actually require students to actually do some reading because what you, they might want to have a look at what is out there and maybe compare it also with what is needed and maybe as a result they might identify some goals that they, they might want to pursue. They might want to divide into groups to pursue those goals. And they might also identify um, objectives that each of the group wants to pursue. So as much as they need it, some um, assistance in point four to understand uh, to actually engage in uh, to actually engage with you and with your ideas about what's out there in the community worth worth actually pursuing and exploring and also they needed the reading support in order to actually read up a little bit about the problem right they will also need some more reading support when they actually go on to pursue their projects. Now, identified and designed in order to address a specific community need. So you need the reading support to actually read up about the problem and then you also need some reading support in order to actually address the problem, right? So um, I will just look first at the ACARA framework. So in module four, you have these uh, frameworks. I just don't know whether I can actually identify them easily in, um, I can. So this is the module four, any second. And there's all this text about learning support. And we have more, so, okay, the concept of difference. And then we have a framework for structuring assignment too. So you've got these two frameworks. So this is one about ACARA and then this one about early years framework, right? So uh, let me now go back to our PowerPoint, to our uh, Word document. This is the ACARA one. So um, how to read it? I, you, you'd have to be pretty fluent uh, in the readings that are actually supplied in module four to actually know where this text comes from. But let us take it actually a bit slowly. So Akara, personal and social capabilities. So what 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 I uh, so myself with Emmy Norman, we produced a, um, a, a book chapter which is there in your uh, module four somewhere. But basically what we did, we looked for learning evidence from neuroscience and then we were also looking into different uh, disciplines as well to actually contextualize it better and to develop implications for activities and also develop implications for the forms of uh, pedagogic support that is necessary to actually support students' literacy experiences. So the principles that I just uh, explained to you in here are actually in this document. So if so learning activity evidence. So students learn who they are by internalizing their subjective interpretations of other people's beliefs, goals, feelings, and actions. That's from Imordino Young, Helen Imordino Young's paper. So students learn by internalizing their own interpretations. Remember, so you can tell them whatever you want. They will be they will be they do internalize what is outside but they don't they don't actually swallow it what they do they internalize their own interpretations of it so students always look at what they know not what you present to them they always internalize in relation to what they know we are always walking histories we are not um, um, 
you know, a clean slate onto which you pour whatever you believe information is. If we were actually accepting information in an unrestricted manner, we would be sick. So, um, so, so basically, the, so the quality of students learning then uh, will depend. So including their feelings and sense of self-efficacy will depend on the extent to which their interpretations are engaged by the learning environment, right? So the students will only take this much out of it as much you were actually able to, um, to engage. So just presenting a positive role model is not good enough unless it's actually the role model so to speak is broken down into pieces and engage in more than one way because the more you engage the more you break down the aspects of a role model the more you actually dialogize it and enable students to look at that role model uh, from different perspectives not different perspectives of how other people see it but through different angles then we were thinking, well, um, what is it that, so you can read this here and you can read this here, I just don't have time for it. So basically, so what did we think in terms of the social and personal capabilities, right? So what we were thinking is exactly this is the place where we say to you, go to the community and actually get the learning objectives from the community. Right, so identify students' literacy needs by examining those those things like literacy and you know those outcomes by examining them in the context in the community context what 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 does this all mean this is all just words as i said before the, whatever is there is just words so we were trying to unpack those words in assignment 1 so you have some experience already but now in order to actually create a curriculum for your students a syllabus or you know a, a, a thing to engage them in you what we're saying here in order for that those experiences to be transformative right to have a personal and social value to the student which means to be transformative they can only be transformative if they actually are contextualized in relation to their com to students community experiences and therefore what we're saying here is in the derive those uh, needs from the community and that's what we say derive engage with different stakeholders parents academics experienced teachers community members blah 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 right then we're saying here the think of some activities that now can engage students in those objectives that you have identified here and those activities will necessarily involve also some text so that students can actually explore um, identify what the problem is uh, what would be better also maybe look at examples of uh, of things that are done differently and maybe as a result through those explorations here they might be actually in a better position to identify the project you want the situation where the project is not imposed on children, like now we're gonna do this. What you want is you want students to actually, in order to understand what the project involves, they will be better placed if you actually um, engage them in defining their own project. No matter what, how old they are, um, they might, according to their capacities and also processing capacities and their memories, they will be able to do that quite well. And for many of you, this may actually engage how many do you think lessons? Two, three, quite a lot, isn't it? Um, because if you want to produce, if you want actually to produce resources or actually def identify the kinds of resources that you should produce that will engage, that will help students. Um, in identifying the problems that they want to address through their projects and those resources and tools might necessarily involve reading and therefore you need to produce a reading support so that's quite extent an extensive work and this is where 
uh, a lot of people actually so this this process is actually quite missed this process of of identifying the problem this kind of exploration of a situation oh my goodness there are uh, what students or children out there in the hospital so what will you show to a you know five-year-old for example five-year-old their children in the hospital were having such a great time in classroom and there are our friends out there so what kind of uh let's 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 sort of uh, you know think imaginatively what kind of um resources and activities you could create for students to actually understand the problem and then also devise or or agree on the things that they would like to create for those children so i've got here examples for little children so did that, what did they write here? Illustrate examples of how different school ki children or kids display their school membership, how they can add information and build increasingly rich stories about themselves. Well, that's very interesting, right? So you can have create a book about themselves. Um, they can create a book, like a classroom book, you know, the class book about ourselves. They can actually create it on, um, um, they can actually print it out or they could actually create one online. Um, obviously not to be displayed for the entire universe, but you can have private uh, sites that are only visible within the school environment, either through a password or whatever structure, right? only visible to the people who have the link and very few people have a link. So you could obviously explore uh, with students what it is, what, what, how different children actually um, display information about them, their membership to the school. So you can actually show them examples. Look, other children, you can show them, you can actually create fake entries uh, and to show examples or you can actually use some examples of maybe all the children and then we can minimize it to our own um, possibilities but basically what i'm saying is you could actually create some um, examples and give students examples to how different children display their school membership what kind of um, class books they have I'll give you an example actually so that you can actually see how things can be done. So when I was teaching, this is just a concept thing. It's all nonsense, right? Uh, I just invented it myself. I don't even know what these words mean. So sorry if I created something that means something wrong. Anyway, so I, I was teaching Mandarin teachers how to teach Chinese. So we created this Ni Hao Hai. Cool, wasn't it? I invented that. Uh, <laughs> name so we have nihai hai news so this is a class website uh, surely you can do cooler and better but you should have multilingual site even if it means collecting stuff from uh, you know translating through google translate but here's our class and then the database allows us to have different people so let's have a look at tamara oops the wrong way to click on it tamara what does Tamara have? Well, look at this. This is welcome to my site. This is Tamara in Chinese. Of course not. I invented that. And you can't see it, but Tamara has a menu. So maybe I'll be able to show it to you without losing the entire site, including our recording. So here's Tamara. She's got the things. So she wrote about herself in English and in Chinese. Then she has her little projects. And normally they would show through, but they don't show anymore through. Oh, they, some of them do. Okay, so she's got her projects here. Then she's got Chinese etiquette projects. So she's got these things. Some things do come through, some things on photo album. Let's have a look whether the photo album still works. Well, there you go, photo album. Right, so you can have all of that. And more. So I'm gonna close it. Okay. So obviously you could create actually, um, you could actually show something like this to children. And now 
we would like to know what what it, what this website says and what this website does and obviously from pictures students can detect that this is something about our class because this is class from you know our older children's or friends uh, pictures are there there are descriptions of them there and we want something like that and we don't have it and we don't even know how to do it because we're not very good at writing but we can cheat Right. Remember, cheating is the best way to learn anything. So how can we cheat? Well, let's have a look what these websites are saying so we can put everything through uh, the podcast. Remember, there is an podcast link on level f on uh, in module four and the podcast. Uh, what does it do? It actually reads out everything you type into it. So you basically with children, you go, OK, we don't know what that means. We're just going to go select it. How do we copy? And they will say control C. Uh, miss and you go control C and then you go to outcast I don't have an outcast here don't make me do that I don't remember you have to uh, find it somewhere so you go to outcast every time you type outcast it will get you there so you go to outcast and you go enable the thing allow and then you go and how do we paste it and they will say control V and they're learning computers right and then they go, where, where do we click? You say to them, where do we click for the uh, avatar to, sp to speak? They say, they say on this one. And you say, how do you know that on this one? Because it says say it. But how do you know it says say it? Because we've done it before. Okay, so let's go. Oh my goodness. That's not necessarily the name, right? She probably would have had the name like this. So you would have had the name of some other child and it would say, yeah, almost like the way I almost the way I say it. So let's go Emmy Norman. Well, oh, it's a very funny accent though. I have to give it to you. It's really weird. Um well, we'll have to live with it. So it's English. Julie is from US. Well, let's make Julie Grace Australian. Let's have a look how that goes. terrible but it's kind of like oh my god what a difference this is how we speak in australia all right well that's very recognizable what about if we used uh uk now this is a free version right we must remember because a paid version might be better but a free version oh that's better that sounds good i like the uk version Wonderful, Amy Norman. Use the UK version, All right? So you can know. Oh my God! So Amy Norman has her own website. Ah, this is really cool. And they can, you know, and they can do these things. So basically, you can actually cheat. So you can say to them, but they would say, but we don't know how to write. So where do you go? You go to Google to to tap talk typer, right? And you can actually with a talk typer and switching between talk typer and this, you can actually create a whole um you can actually not only create a whole website but you can also actually read someone else's website so that would be good so this one is exquisite for reading so children can actually divide into groups and they can read by themselves different entries on the website and actually explore what is there and they will find it i don't know what they will find it you have to have a look whether that works or not in practice so in order not to destroy everything I've done in my formal lecture, I would not actually uh, go in, in detail into reading strategies because I've spoken about it and, and you have them there in, the, in module four. But basically you, use, you, util, you, you give students access to a multitude of um, tools so that they can actually deal with this text, but it doesn't have to be too exhaustive. It's only an exploratory phase. So, so it is just only for them to see what wonderful things are out there and they can actually also create themselves. And how would a child from the hospital be engaged? Because they can actually create an entry for the child in that website. So the child is included in the school class, in the, in the, in the class book. And depending how interactive you can make it, you can actually create a book where the child can actually select things and click on them and play them himself or herself so they can actually play their own name make the make make if a website is um 
interactive in Apple, the PowerPoint, it is if, if it is created in a way that actually a child can actually did, uh, ident no, click on something and actually get the computer read it for them, that's wonderful. But a good thing would be to actually go with children, create a class website using different reading strategies to help them first to read what other children have, then decide on the goal and then provide more tools so that they can actually create more reading support so that they can now with a greater detail read about the specific genre within which they, so examples of a specific genre within which they want to actually produce their own information and be a bit more focused about how to spell, how to write, how to present it, where to put what different type of information, the picture, the movie about themselves, whatever. And then wouldn't it be nice to create a little, so in, to also include our, uh, friends who are in the hospital, include them there in the class book, but at the same time create a little story for the child in the hospital of how you actually learned what, did, what skills did you learn and how you were learning them in order to share them with the person in the hospital. So in one way or another, try your best to allow the child in the hospital to uh, follow your footsteps and also engage a little bit as much as you can make it possible for the child to actually engage in the reading of that site and as a result expanding his or her reading skills. Well, that would be a challenging thing and a very worthwhile thing to do. I will throw in this slide here that I have so I'll just give it to you. Um, um, I'll give it to you just in case. So basically when students when students finish their exploratory stage, these are the kinds of questions that you can actually not just ask of yourself to actually self-examine uh, your own, uh, uh, you know, your, the quality of your delivery, but also you can actually engage children in those questions so that they can now develop organizing systems about their own learning, right? So um, you obviously do not read them out, those questions, because I think that the language was, I took it from our uh, book chapter with Amy Norman, so it, it is kind of a bit more academic, that language, but you can translate it into a regular vocabulary, but these are the sort of questions you ask yourself and you can ask them too. What is it that we have discovered, you know? What is it that we now know and we didn't know before? Uh, what have we learned about ourselves? You know, how does it make us feel now about ourselves? What expertise? What did we? What did we see? What did we see? Where did we learn it from? You know, what kind of things did we did we read or engage? Don't use the word engage. Some kind of more um, more appropriate word like what have we read? Uh, you know, you know how wildly did we read? How many resources did we explore? Oh, my vocabulary is really academic. So has the learning impacting on how they now know about, okay, so what can we tell about our community now? What have we learned? Oh my goodness, that there is a soccer club, or that there is this club, or there's a hospital where our friends are in the hospital, and the hospital is not far away. And actually, we can actually communicate with our students. We didn't know that. What questions do they believe are worth following up, and how can they be Engage further. Yeah. What 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 do we want to do now? What is it that we need to? What would we like to know? Can we can we can we do something for the child? Can we now do something that we have seen in that you know on that website? Can we do a website like the ki other kids have? And can we also you know put our students on it? We will create entries for our students. We'll do it together, and you will probably see that the entry created for the student in the hospital will be probably nicer than anyone created about themselves. Okay, so that's um, that's one lot of questions. And now when it comes to, so this is basically summary of the exploratory phase. And now it is now, okay, so we now have done that. And what will we do? So these are other questions, but they are now forward looking questions, right? So not what we have done, but what can be done? 
has this action to build strong communities you know so you sort of in you reduce it to a level of um uh, that can be appropriate for your children these questions right has this initiative to have a positive impact on students as individuals and their perceptions of others right so you translate it to them so basically these are sort of goals within which students frame their ob um, projects worded obviously differently but somehow like this but this wording serves you to evaluate the quality of the tasks that students will now pursue, but from your academic perspective. And if you translate these goals now to their language, to students' language, they will be able now to think of their project, not like, oh yeah, yeah, let's do it, and we do this, and we do this. Now, they, you know, they think of things like, wow, questions emerged. Oh my goodness, we're, we're, you know, we're thinking about each other. We're thinking about community. We're thinking also about how does it help us think of ourselves and, and of our um, friends and has that impacting on on uh, on what on the community that they yeah will that be good for anyone who's gonna benefit from such a website where we include our students who are in hospital who's gonna benefit our friends yes what about who else we will benefit because our students are on our map yeah they're with us and what else we were teaching them how to do the reading, right? Fantastic. You can say it. So these are good questions to sort of insert. Um, things that I give you, like these questions, or these principles, or even these texts, or that, these to be taken, copied, and pasted into the assignment, right? So this is not about plagiarizing. When I give you structures, which are no different than 1 plus 1 equals 2, they are just ready answers. These to be copied and pasted, so you can use them for your rationale or anything. So because that's why I'm giving them, that's why I'm producing them, so that people copy and paste and insert them in the uh, correct places in their unit uh, planning. And definitely remember that before you actually started all this planning, you have actually translated. So this is the beginning also of your of your planning of your design uh, you translated the community objectives into the ACARA or early years learning framework objectives so um, so you know where you're going so even though I produce for you now these broad uh, statements like I'll just discuss it here in a few seconds the activities that you design and the resources that you have made available for students to engage in order to explore what is required and resources enabling students to actually inform their reading, to help them to read, all of them draw on those objectives that you have derived from the community needs and translated in relation to ACARA or early layers framework. So this is very simple now. So we started with the inspire and now so the students um, so the students now are clearly moving now towards the definition of their projects and all they have to do now is actually complete their projects. And in order to complete their projects you basically make sure that they have access to support, to your support, and that could be either whole classroom support or support where they use different resources you prepared for them in groups or individually. So you have these three levels of different ways of working with um, support system to help students to read. So it is individual, group, and whole class. At the whole class level, you want to develop some set of uh, shared uh, awarenesses. Then you enable students to actually work individually. Then individually, they, as part of groups, but individually, they complete some work, they share it with their group, and then the group shares with the classroom. So these are the sort of stages you might use. And I think that I've written sort of quite sensible things here that as students now go about 
um, creating their own website or creating what their own projects are that they will decide to pursue it's important now um, in, in, the, in the engagement phase that we offer them feedback opportunities which acknowledge personal and country, cultural uniqueness of students so this is here what the, these um, feedback opportunities will be a number of them that I discussed in, in module 4 which is not, not only opportunities to explore alone or explore with a group or with a classroom but also um, those feedback opportunities should draw on and integrate different multi, uh, multicultural, multilingual, multicultural symbols, both, right? So that children who are from different country, their symbols are integrated into the designs. Uh, so they don't have to be indigenous. They could be from Vietnam. They could be from Congo. I don't know, from different countries. We need to be sensitive to what kind of children we have and that we legitimize the difference and, and also utilize the symbols for decoration, the symbols for writing, um, maybe specific uh, uh, color uh, associations that, um, you know, how different cultures have used different colors together. Like indigenous people have brown, red and yellow. Um, so different, uh, so those choices. The idea is not to overpower just because we're actually teaching English literacy in an Anglo in, in an Anglo-Saxon system or in an Australian system it doesn't mean that all support materials should be about comparing English with English only so it is for example it's really good for children to be exposed to different alphabets so like you have a connection here between English alphabet in you know like an, an pictures so th I created those I put the banana here I put the stretch cut here this is actually a um, link to um, Asian alphabet so hiragana I think the same um, uh, the same uh, character is also probably for a boy or for a man or for walking in in Chinese I don't know but then you can make connection with this Right, I got it from the web. I can't remember. Oh, here's the link. I think you have that. So easyjapanese.org. Um, so there. So I got these things here. So this is very nice to basically give you children an idea and students an idea that um, characters evolved. Uh, I pers personally have a theory that Asian characters evolved from grains of rice because they just look like that, as if someone played with grains of rice and started to create characters. But anyway, you know, characters evolved. So there were pictographs first, and then we have that. Um, links to different cultures. Um, so that would uh, cover... Um, Yes, so basic. So that's what I meant here. Offers feedback that is uh, that acknowledges the diversity of the community. So on the one hand, is is, uh, acknowledges uniqueness because um, all these manipulations, especially, I mean, as primitive as it looks like when you use the talk typer and uh, and the way I explained it in my um, in module four in those uh, videos, that whether it's the talk typer or avatar and also using f uh, online games but the way I, I was talking about them and where to actually at what point to engage them what they do they enable students on manipulation of sounds and that's really really good because it's a student that is actually typing the student who's actually pressing the student who's actually deleting letters and adding letters and playing with sounds that's what you want is that play so that that's in that in that seemingly to us chaotic way they develop relationship between the sound and um and and their representations so and then the last is evaluate i don't think you will have actually time and for enough i mean there's only five lesson or five sort of sequential um, stages that you need to design for my assignment so i'm not sure where you'll get to evaluate 
but this is the time when students actually are able to actually to look at those very questions again and ask themselves whether they've achieved what they actually have set out to do. Please also read about how I suggest here how to go about assessment and reporting. I know it's very little, but actually it's quite powerful because it um, once you understand the design of, um, of planning, then uh, it will make your life easier to work with the administrative processes. But anyway, so for the purpose for our assignment, this is the kind of design that I am actually asking you to consider. And this would be the things that I would like to say. Right? So what might be different and what hasn't appeared yet in our discussion board uh, examples was that connection to the community and deriving the learning uh, objectives from the community and then translating the, those through uh, ACARA and early years learning framework and as a result um, thinking of activities and resources that will allow students our students to engage in those objectives that we have actually agreed on with the community representatives to actually for our students to follow up. So what we want students now to engage in activities that allow them to actually explore the problem, identify project, organize themselves in teams, go through the project, use more of our help uh, strategies in order to actually enable students to complete the project and then also go back to th in, the, in the last stage to the points here that allow us to assess, so allow students to assess and also allow you to assess, so both groups assess for themselves whether they achieved what they wanted to achieve. Now, if you open if you open the early years learning framework, you will notice that the structure of it is very much the same as for ACARA, because you because you will notice that actually very often it's the same thinking that generated one and the other curriculum, but they use different words in order to uh, make the text more relevant to a particular age group. But basically being is the same as the, um, integration with the community. Um, belonging is about recognition of our differences. So it's that ethical and intercultural. And then becoming has this evaluative aspect to it which allows now, which, which is the phase whereby we actually complete our projects and evaluate um, the extent to which we achieved our goals in, in what ways. Now, this is a very long lecture. I will finish now and I expect probably questions which are a bit more detailed on the learn line. And if needed, um, Definitely, we will have another collaborate class. I certainly will be there available to you on, thurs on Thursday at five o'clock next week and the week after for as long as the semester lasts, right? So I am every day on Thursday online. And today I was online, but nobody appeared. But that's okay. Here we have a podcast, so hopefully it will help.